Good luck. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Marcel Montañez, and I will present you my master thesis with title Posidonia Oceanica Restoration, Study of Early Signs of Epifaunal Recovery and Community Recovery. So for a seagrass restoration to be successful, the restored area should uh, persist and recover similar uh, ecosystem functions of that of a natural seagrass meadow. In order to test the success of a restoration, many studies have compared the restored areas uh, with natural and restored areas used as reference sites. But generally, the aim of a restoration project is not only to restore the habitat per se, but also to restore the ecosystem services that it provides. And seagrass meadows are enhanced coastal productivity and biodiversity by sustaining, sustaining a variety of epifaunal invertebrates, which themselves provide a high, high secondary production. This epifaunal community is a very important trophic link between the primary producers and high, higher trophic levels, many of which are species of commercial importance. The epifaunal communities associated to the seagrasses can can and might change according to the intrinsic characteristics of the seagrasses, such as structural complexity, which can be measured as, for instance, seagrass biomass, seagrass leaf surface, or epiphyte, epiphyte load. So these epif epifaunal communities have been observed to um, be positively, so sorry, so the abundance and diversity of the epifaunal communities have been observed to be positively and strongly related to the structural complexity of seagrasses. Under the Red Electrica de España Marine Forest Project, two hectares of Posidonia Oceanica has been replanted and this replantation is now being monitored in order to follow up the development of the transplantation and the community recover. So uh, in this study, we evaluate the recovery of the bifaunal community 13 and 21 months after the restoration and the aim is to look uh, for signs and the extent of the epifaunal recovery, comparing five habitats with different habitat complexity. So the hypothesis is that the epifaunal community will show a gradient of abundance and diversity, matching the habitat complexity of the different habitats. The expected abundance and diversity are the, from the following areas, are the from highest to lowest, the edge middle, inner middle, the plantation areas, and the dead mat, which I will explain. Following. So moving on to the materials and methods, um, the study area was located in the Pollensa Bay in north of Mallorca, Spain. There, uh, the plantation area was divided in eight plantation units, but we will only focus on plantation unit one, which was, which was, one, which was 24, 21 months at the time of sampling, and the plantation units two and three, which were 13 months, and there, that will be treated as a single one. So each plantation unit was organized in a grid where at each intersection there was a plantation node and each plantation node main, means uh, 16 fragments of Posidonia oceanica planted. The second habitat is the dead mat and can be found in between the nodes, so in the rest of the area. Um, the dead mat or simply mat is a uh, um, degraded Posidonia, Posidonia oceanica meadow which is now formed by the dead rhizomes and sediments. And the dominant um, macrophyte is now another seagrass, Simonoceanodosa. The two remaining habitats are 200 meters southern from the plantation area and are part of the unnatural and disturbed meadow, the edge of the meadow and the inner part of the meadow, which is at least 10 meter, at a 10 meter distance from any edge. So for the collection of epifauna, light traps were placed for 24 hours and their design is kind of similar to a lobster trap. So then the, they were recovered and their content was um, filtered with a 63 micrometer mesh. So then the epifauna could be collected in ethanol 70% and then classified under the stereo, stereo microscope in the laboratory. Then for the measurement of the habitat complexity, the density and maximum leaf length under each trap were measured for both uh, Posidonia oceanica and Simodo oceanodosa. Also, shoots were collected for both seagrasses, but not for Posidonia under the, in the plantation areas, as it would be counterproductive for the project. 
and from those shots, morphometry, meaning weight, width, and length were measured, as well as biomass. So for these shots here, that uh, in the plantation, their morphometry and biomass were estimated with the available data from another study of this project from Rodriguez. So what was obtained then with this data was epifaunal abundances in each habitat, also epifaunal densities for um, macrophyte leaf area and epifaunal densities for macrophyte biomass. From this, a non-metrical multidimensional scaling was performed to compare the community composition as well as uh, either ANOVA or Kruskal Wallis for the different taxa that were found for the total number of epifauna and also for Shannon diversity and species richness. If significant differences were found, then a post hoc to test was also performed. Moreover, for the habitat complexity measurements, so um, leaf area and biomass per habitat, um, also ANOVA or Kruskal Wallis that were performed, and if differences were found, um, a post hoc to test was also performed. I took it test or we put some men with me, depending on the if it was ANOVA or Kruskal Wallis. So moving on to the results, well, a total of 17 taxa were found, and here we see the p-values from for the different analysis. For the number of individuals per trap, only one taxa was found to have significant differences between habitats, and no differences were found in the total number of uh, epifauna, and the non differences were found um, in the Shannon diversity uh, or species niches. Then for the density of epifauna um, for leaf area, for square meters, nine of the 17 taxa showed significant differences, and also significant differences were found for the um, total abundance of epifauna. And for the density of epifauna for leaf biomass, seven taxa showed significant differences, and also um, differences were found for the total abundance. So here we just, just see like a, a part of the previously seen table from which I'm going to show some graphs related to them. So for the grammar dye for leaf area, um, as I said, we found, well, we found significant differences between habitats. So the highest densities of grammar dye were found in the mat area, followed by the plantation one, and then the other three habitats show similar values. And we see that the mat has significantly higher values than the edge and inner and plantation unit two and three, but not respect plantation unit one. Then for the copy pots for um, density for biomass, um, we see two clearly differentiated groups, one for mat and the plantation unit, which is significantly higher than the other one for edge and inner meadows. Then for the total, uh, well, the density, total abundance of, for leaf area. We see again that the mat shows the highest epifaunal densities, followed again by the plantation units and lastly the edge and inner middle. Um, in this case, the mat and plantation unit wide don't show differences, but there are differences between mat and the other four habitats. Then for plantation, both plantation units show significantly different higher um, densities respect the inner middle, but um, Plantation unit one has differences with the edge, but not um, plantation unit two and three. And lastly, for the abundance of epifauna for leaf biomass, we see again the same as copy pots, two clearly differentiated groups. One that it's higher for mat and plantation units, and another that it's uh, lower for edge and inner meadows. So just so you have a general picture of the table that we previously seen, and when significant differences were found, the graphs that were obtained were somewhere in between this one and this other one. So either two clearly differentiated groups or that the mat had the highest values and then followed by plantations and lastly the edge and inner meadows. For the MDS, here we see for the density of epifauna for leaf area. We see that there is no differentiated in the epifaunal communities. They are all mixed together, so their composition is similar. And if we now look at the habitat complexity comparison between habitats, here we see the total leaf area per trap, and here the total leaf biomass per trap. 
we see that the highest habitat complexity in both cases is for edge and inner meadows, then followed by the plantation um, areas, and lastly, the mat, which in the case of um, biomass is not significantly different than, than plantation unit one, but in this case, we see that the, they are significantly different. So now we move into the discussion. So as just seen, uh, we did find uh, a gradient of habitat complexity between the uh, structural complexity between the areas, but we didn't find any differences in the abundance nor in the diversity between the habitats. These results agree um, are contrary to some other studies that have found that the structural complexity of seagrass meadows strongly influences the epifaunal abundance and diversity. But on the other hand, it agrees with other studies that have found that the mat areas between Posidonia and Oceanica meadows are an essential part of the seagrass habitats during the winter time, which was the case of this study. Sorry, I forgot to say that the sampling was done between December and February of the from December 2019 and February of 2020. And then, uh, as we've seen, the, there are also differences on the densities of the of epifauna between the different habitats. But it turns out that those areas with uh, small habitat and um, structural habitat complexity are those ones with highest densities and the other way around. So it could be that the differences in the densities are, well, it is the case that the differences in the densities are due to the differences in habitat complexity and not to the differences in epifaunal abundances. Um, but in the hand, the similarity of densities between plantation and mat suggests that the plantation, planted Posidonia oceanica had no effect in the epifauna and therefore there is that there is no recovery in the epifaunal communities in the plantation habitats. Still, it's important to follow up the process on a longer frame time. And why is that? Well, because studies have reported that the epifaunal abundance and diversities fluctuate um, along the seasons in the seagrass habitats. And this is usually translated in low abundances and richness during the winter time. One of the the factors that um, makes that happen is changes in structural complexity in the seagrasses, which is not the case for Posidonia oceanica, but it is for Simodocea nodosa. And these changes are usually translated in low shoot density size and biomass during winter times. So to conclude, well, if we remember the initial hypothesis, that was that the epifaunal community would show a gradient of abundance and diversity matching the habitat complexity of the different habitats. Well, we definitely found the gradient of habitat complexity, but we didn't find any gradient of abundance nor diversity of epifauna. Um, as regarding the similarities between and the materials and the plantation, we can say that the, there is no recovery in the plantation communities, but still it's important to keep a long-term monitoring to evaluate the progress of the epifaunal community in the in the plantation. Two minutes. I would like to thank Jorge and Ines, my promoter and supervisor, supervisors, for guiding me through this process. Also, the Red Electrica de España for funding the project and the Aerodromo Militar de Poyensa for helping in the in the restoration project.